Is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out his plan for us. So welcome to church. Good morning. Welcome to Open Door Church this morning. It's so exciting to see so many people in the house before we start worship. So I just invite you to stand up, open up your hearts, and just get ready to lift up the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Oh 
house of the Lord. And today is Communion Sunday, so it's even more awesome to be in the house of the Lord today. We just welcome you to Open Door Church this morning, and we are so glad that you are here worshiping the King with us. We would love to say hello and connect with you. Do we have any guests in the house for the first time today? Good morning. So good to have you here. Oh, back there too. Awesome. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> So awesome to have you with us this morning. Um, you're going to get some visitor packets, and that's just a great way to connect. And everyone can connect with us by texting CONNECT to 757-320-5615. Uh, we have some amazing opportunities for us as a church and individuals to express our generosity during this season of Thanksgiving and remembrance of the ultimate gift that we received with Jesus. Uh, we have the Operation Christmas Shoebox going on, and those boxes are due back next Sunday. So please, on your way out, there's these pamphlets in the back table there. Pick one up, fill out the information, get a shoebox together, and bless a child because this really does minister to them. We have our Thanksgiving boxes that are going to be distributed on the 20th of November, and we have all of that, but we're still collecting food for our regular distribution that's also happening that day. So if you would like to donate food or money, Sister Amy has put a list on Facebook that we can go check to see items that we need to help fill those baskets. Um, and the best way is to give your money through tithes and offering because that is how we are able to touch the world. You'll notice all those plaques back there. There used to be a bunch of flags hanging there, but this church touches the world. So every penny that we give to this church is a penny that's not only invested here in this body, in this city, in this state, in this country, it goes out throughout the world. And like, I may not ever be able to set foot on Africa, but my money has, and my money does. And I just love being able to invest in the kingdom of God through my tithes and offerings. And one, um, we just made it super easy for you to be able to give no hassle whatsoever. You can text GIVE to 757-320-5555. You can give online at odcsuffolk.com slash GIVE. You can pay via your bank through bill pay, or you can drop it by the office, put it in the mail, or put it in one of the buckets at the back. See, super easy, super easy. All you got to do is fill out that check and seek first the kingdom of God. And an easy way to do that is to put your money where your faith is and trust God for everything. All right. So after praise and worship, our children are going to be dismissed. The infants and toddlers, zero to three, are going to exit through the exit sign over there. Um, our nurseries are back there. So you can take your kids back there to infant and toddler nursery. The rest of the kids, four to 12, will be dismissed to the foyer where their teachers will take them up to their class. The only thing we ask is that as soon as church is over, please, please go retrieve your children so that the teachers can be released as well. All right. So excited. Everybody back on your feet. It's just a glorious morning to be in the house of God and lift up the name of Jesus. And I'm so excited to be able to do it with my family.
is in you, God. And we rest in you. We have victory. That you're fighting for us and you're fighting our battles, God. Jesus, you said we should come unto you, come unto the Father as children, Lord. Children who trust you, children who look to you, who are humble. And God, we come to you with humble hearts, with hearts like children today, Lord.
Yeah. 
us unto the land that we give our praise. Unto the land. Slain from the foundation of the world. His name is Jesus Christ. I love so much when we sing about that lamb, Jesus Christ. And we give him honor, we give him glory. He's the only one that's worthy. Can we give him a hand this morning? Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. He is worthy, he's worthy, he's worthy, he's worthy, he's worthy. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to dismiss our children now. respective classes and <clears throat> we have quite a message for you today it's about 15 pages long on my notes I have 700 verses 16 definitions and I don't know how many points I have makes Brandis think of the old days can we give our worship team a hand this morning? They did a great job. <clears throat> and before we get too far along, just so we don't have to do this at the end, if you did not get um, a cup before you came in this morning, please raise your hand so we can make sure that you have a cup for communion. We'll be doing communion at the end of the message today. So does anyone need, didn't get a cup? Oh, there's a few back in the back back there, Uncle Charlie. I just want to welcome everyone this morning uh, on behalf of my wife and I, for those of you that contributed and those of you that wanted to contribute, uh, those that you can still contribute, thank you for our wonderful uh, outing up in Lancaster, PA. We had a fantastic time and we'd probably be, after we spied the land out for a few days, we'll probably be rolling back up there sometime soon, so if you miss us, then that's probably where we're at. The train didn't break down on us, thank the Lord. It got to the end of the track, and they moved the engine around and took us back the other way. So we had a great time. And I was watching an early Christmas show yesterday, and I looked on this, and they had a guy sitting on the train, a conductor with another lady that were talking, and honey, it looked just like the train. It had the same seats and everything. So I went back and looked at it again, waiting for that train to come back up. So I think we were actually on a celebrity train. But for those of you that are guests today with us, it's good to have you. Um, those of you that came back from last week, Chad did a great job, and we appreciate the Denny's and a good portion of them out today. They're trying to spend the last few days that um, Colin is here before he goes back to Hawaii. So um, they're, they're, actually, they're actually worshiping where we worshiped last week. They're worshiping a new song where my son's at up in the Vienna area. And so we just swap places this week, so. I want you to just kind of sit back for a moment and, um, and just think about a word that we don't hear a lot about, a word that is really not in the vocabulary of the Western world that we live in, and that's the word covenant. The word covenant. Now, this word is stirred in my heart because my wife has challenged me to read a book that she's been challenging me to read for several years. So I bought the book. This is the book. I even put it on, my kin on the Kindle reader so I could take it wherever I went. But being the person I am, I forgot to read the book. I also forgot, conveniently, I suppose, where I put the book. So she ordered another book. <laughs> and then I... Yeah. Yeah. What? And then I found my book. And then I found it on my Kindle, of which I didn't think I was ever going to find because I forgot my password, <laughs> <laughs> conveniently. So the name of the book, I'll tell you in just a moment. Turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 13 and verse 20. And for those of you that don't have the paper Bibles in front of you, those of you who don't have uh, phones in front of you or computers, um, we have it on a screen for you. It says, Now to the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood 
of the everlasting covenant. That's probably not a verse that a lot of people read about, but now I say, wow, that is so powerful. The God of peace brought us again from the dead of our Lord Jesus Christ, that, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Can we pray for a moment? Father, I come in Jesus' name, and I thank you, Lord, for each and every person that's here. I thank you, Lord, for the many, many blessings you've placed in this house, the many lives we've been able to touch, Lord, here, and as Jen said, around the world. We pray for all those ministries that we are a part of, that we contribute to, that we minister to, that we put our feet in their living rooms and in their churches and their, in their countries and their lands. And we pray, God, that you would bless them. The Lord, continue to move in their lives and expand all the ministries that we're a part of. We pray, God, that you would just touch each and every person here today, God. And, Lord, let them be challenged in a new realm, a new level, Lord, as far as this word. We're going to talk about today, covenant, in Jesus' name, amen. There's a lot in that verse, and we could preach on that verse in itself, but that's just our introductory verse. So I'm reading this book, and the title of the message, if you're interested, is God is a Covenant God. If you've been somewhere in life and you have um, not been able to live, live through or fulfill covenant that you've committed or you committed to and you rebooted your life in some way, this is for where you're at today, right now. It's not where you were at, not what happened to you, because God is a God of grace, God is a God of mercy, God is a God of truth, and God is a God of recovery, I believe, as well. So I'm reading this book called Two Fleas and No Dog. Okay, that's the book. I am through three chapters now, of which the last chapter was painful because it was more than three, book, three, three pages. <laughs> it's like 30 pages. And me being the kind of person I am, I just want to find, I'm just keep looking, but where's the last page? Where's the last page? I, you know, I, about fi I finally got through it. But this book is an interesting book. As I said, my wife asked me to read it several times. So I ordered it. Got sidelined. I missed places, you heard. We got another book. So she gave me an assignment to read the book. Husbands, have you ever received an assignment from your wife reading a book? You have? Me and Charlie in the same boat. Me and Charlie are the two fleas. <laughs> but this book is a very purposeful read. It has some interesting things to say about fleas and the dog. And you see, you know that fleas don't have any honor. They care only about themselves. And what they get from the dog or from any other host that they can find to live on or any other animal which they may ride upon to get their nourishment and to get them wherever they need to go and accomplish whatever they need accomplished. So you see, the fleas are freeloaders. So the line in the book is from fleetum to freedom. That's not my line. That's the guy in the book wrote that. From fleetum to freedom. And the premise of the book is uh, about marriage. And about a husband and a wife and how they kind of work in the marriage the wrong way instead of the right way. So if you're married and you want to enhance your marriage, you want your marriage to get better, if you just read the first three chapters, if you read the first chapter, it will help you in your relationship with your spouse. I'm so challenged by the book that... I felt to minister out of a word from the book. And the book reiterates the importance and the value of covenant. Everyone say covenant with me. Covenant. You see, fleas feed off the blood of the humans or the animals they live on. Whether it's dogs or cats or people or any range of hosts. But when they live there, whatever they have, they can transmit that or communicate that to the host or to the dog. So I found out that they could transmit tapeworms, diseases, urine typhus, 
dangerous things that need medical attention or cause, listen, cause death, confusion, stupor, or imbalance. I took those words there from that definition because if our marriages are not strong, if we're not the right pe- or aren't being the right people in our marriage, then guess what can happen to our marriage? Our marriage can need attention. Death comes to a marriage. Confusion comes to a marriage. Stupor and imbalance comes to a marriage if we're not living in that relationship properly. Can you understand that? Does that make sense? So my question is this, is are you living in covenant or are you living like a flea? Are you a freeloader? Are you a person that's causing trouble in your marriage? Are you a person that's, that's living apart from the covenant that you should be living in? Now, the problem is, is that we don't really understand what that word covenant means. We think we do, but we really don't. So I want to kind of begin to take some of this thought here, this process of this book that we're reading. And again, I want to begin to get, get it close to being done today. So we might be in this word covenant for a, a little while. But covenant is at the root of our marriage. It's not a contract. It's not a transaction. See, covenant is where where God started in the very beginning. And we're going to go back to that in just a moment. But God is a God of covenant. God wants us to live in covenant. Our marriages should be established in covenant. If you're thinking about getting married or want to get married sometime sooner or later, then I want to tell you something. If you come talk to us, we're going to give you a little bit more information than we have been giving in the past about the importance of covenant and about the way that you should be living within that marriage. If you're living in a flea state marriage where you're just kind of freeloading, where you're just kind of living off the other person and, and, and you're, you're not really working in this thing in the right way and you're... Um, a flea, then we want to help you get out of that and un- help you understand what covenant is. If you're watching online, it's the same thing for you. God is a covenant God, and we want to live in covenant. If you're young and you've just been married for a short while, then understand that covenant is the basis whereby you've been married. If you've been married a long time, then you've been living in covenant, whether you know it or not, because you've endured some things. You've lasted through some stuff that was very, very difficult. My wife and I have been living in covenant for 42 and a half years. To state that today is a monumental statement because people don't live in covenant marriages very, very long anymore. Matter of fact, the average is probably around 7 to 10, 12 years maybe. I don't, I'm just throwing those numbers out. But most people don't stay married because when things get tough, things get rough, things don't go their way, then they jump off. The dog they're on, and they jump on another dog. They freeload somewhere else. They begin to get something from someone else because what they want is not there. Covenant. It's the root of our marriage. It's the way it should be because God established our covenant in the very beginning. But we don't understand that, what covenant is. In a covenant, there's no place for you to take advantage of another person. In a real covenant, there is no place for you to infect the other person. In a real covenant, there's no place where you want to get all that you can get from that person, and you want to use that person to get where you want to go. A covenant is more than that. I didn't marry my wife to put me through school. I didn't marry my wife, you know, to help me Do the things I'm doing. I marry my wife because I love my wife. I marry my wife because I want to be committed to her until the very end, until death do us part, which is a covenant vow, whether you know it or not. It's not not just something you can kind of take take it or leave it. When we got married, I came from a broken home, and my desire, my, my very, very strong desire, my put down my foot desire, my anchor desire was no matter what happens, no matter how things are, I am going to stay married. I do not want to get a divorce. Have we had hard times? Sure. Has she had hard times? Probably. She's lived with me. Have things always been easy? No. Have we had problems? Yes. Have we had financial problems? Yes. We didn't think we could pay the bills sometimes. We didn't know if we were going to have to get food stamps on occasion. We didn't maybe didn't know where we were going to live when we first moved down here after we came to the church at 15 people on the storefront. But we committed 
ourselves to each other and we committed ourselves to the words that we said and we committed ourselves to God that this is what God wanted and we were going to make sure we stayed together. That we were going to continue to pull on the knot that we tied the day we got married and we're going to pull on it to make it tighter, not do anything to try to loosen it. Now again, I'm not talking about where you were at. I'm talking about where we're at today. Okay, where we're at right now. I want us to think about some scriptures in the Bible concerning covenant right now. Turn with me to the book of Romans chapter 1. This book that I'm talking about is a book about marriage and having a healthy one. But it translates into our relationship also with Jesus and us as the church or the bride. We're not to be here to be freeloading off of Jesus. It's not a, we're not looking after a name it, claim it kind of a doctrine or theology. But there's a relational reaction here with Christ. The word covenant is so powerful, it's so strong, it's so noted in the Bible. That word covenant, as we know it, as we read it in the English, is mentioned more than 292 times in the Scriptures, Old and New Testaments. That's not to say there aren't some other words that indicate covenant because there are, but this in just itself is 292 times. Romans chapter 1, 31 and 32, and I think that you would agree with this, and we don't have time to go into all of Romans, Romans chapter 1 because it's another whole message in itself or multiple messages. Without understanding, it's talking about people, the people in Rome, the people of the world, the culture of that day, and they understood what covenant meant. But notice what he says, without understanding, covenant breakers. Now, I don't know what your Bible says, but covenant breakers is what King James says. Without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgments of God, who knows the justices of God, who knows God's principles, primaries, that they which commit such things, referring to these things and previous things, they're worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. In other words, there's a group of people that are enjoying getting you to break your covenant with God, or and with your spouse, or and with anyone else you have relationship with. There's people that enjoy doing it. They're out to break covenant. They're out to help you lose your covenant, destroy your covenant, get outside your covenant. Beware of those people. There are people right now that the culture we live in is absolutely could care less about covenant and the value of it. We have today what they call a contract. You know what I always heard about a contract? A contract is made so it can be broken. A covenant is made to never be broken. That's the difference. Jesus Christ didn't make a contract with us. He made a covenant with us. He didn't make a contract with Noah after the flood. He made a covenant with Noah after the flood. You hear me? Come on. So I'm talking about covenant today. This is a powerful word. This is a weighty word. This is a word that's got a lot of meat to it, a lot of juice to it. So there's covenants in the Bible. There's like, depending on who you read, depending on what theology you look, or theologian you read or how they look at things, some theologians say there's five covenants. Some theologians say there's seven covenants. Some theologians say there's eight covenants. Well, there's... There's truth in all that. There's five, seven, and eight because it takes five to get seven and seven to get eight, right? Because they're parts of the whole. But the five is the one that they just simplified, the five, boom, boom, boom. The one that says seven, they add in the one about the land of Israel. And then the last one is the one that adds in the eternity uh, covenant of God. But we have, essentially, we have some covenants that are rooted and grounded in, in the earth we live in and who God is and what the Scripture says. So I'm going to try, to try to do this as best I can. See, there's a difference between the way we see covenant, and if I say covenant here in America, here in the West, and if you lived in the, in the East, if you lived over in the Middle East somewhere, their thought of covenant is way different than your thought of covenant. 
We think contract, they think covenant. When they think covenant, they think life, they think death, they think of sacrifice, they think of commitment, they think of blood, they think of clothes, they think of family, they think of tribe, they think of endurance, they think of long-lasting, they think of generations. When we think about it, we think about it to make it as short as we possibly can. And as easy as we possibly can, as convenient as we possibly can. And to have any way possible to get out of it if we think necessary. Covenant. It's a contract or covenant or agreement between two parties. In the Old Testament, the word in the Hebrew transliterated is bereith, B-E-R-I-T-H. It's always translated that way. It's derived from the root word meaning to cut. Hence, a covenant is a cutting with reference to the cutting or dividing of animals into parts and the, con- the contracting parties, passing between them and making a covenant. The corresponding word in New Testament is uh, the athete, which is however rendered New Testament or, or Testament, which should be also covenant. So th- that's, that's what the heart of the word is. Something to do with cutting, something to do with blood, something to do with two people making a covenant together. So let me just kind of br- briefly bring you up to date with these concepts of, or these biblical covenants. And these will make sense to you when you hear them. Now, in the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, we have the first one called the Edenic Covenant. This is really, doesn't say Edenic Covenant, but you see it when, when we read it. The Edenic or Creation Covenant. Um, In Genesis 1, 1 through 5, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form, and void the darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, said it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness night, and the evening, and the morning, the first day. And then he goes on to the next six days. Can I ask you a question? Do we still have light? Yes. Do we still have dark? Do we still have trees? Do we still have water? Do we still have clouds in the sky, stars in the sky? We still got animals and plants, right? We still got people. All those things were the original covenant that God made because they are everlasting. They're going to stay until he returns. Then you have the Adamic, the Adamic covenant, which was given to Adam, which we all use this one when we pre- do weddings, in Genesis chapter 1, 27 to 28. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female. Very important there. Another message. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So, we still have a man and we'll have a woman, right? Hello? Right? And men and women are supposed to do what? Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. That's still happening, right? That's the second covenant. That was the covenant for man. The covenant of Adam. The Adamic covenant. The third covenant is the one everyone likes because when it rains and after it rains, a prism is formed in the sky many, many times. If you're in the right place and the sun's in the right place, you get what? A rainbow, right? That's called the Noahic Covenant. So let's read in Genesis chapter 9, see where God said this and that it's still established and everybody thinks about this. Whether they, know, whether they go to church or not, they think about the rainbow and they think about what God's promise was. Let's look at this. Genesis 9, 8 to 17. We'll read this very quickly. And God spoke to Noah, to his son, saying, Behold, I will establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. See, that continuation, that generational thing. And with every living creature is with you, the fowl, the cattle, every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out to the, out of the ark to every beast of the earth, I will establish my, say it, covenant. Think, with you, neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of flood, neither shall there be any more flood to destroy the earth. Now, you know what? That makes me really happy. 
And I'm not saying there aren't some issues with the climate. I'm not saying there's not some issues with tides rising in certain places. But I will tell you one thing. The world will never be destroyed because of rising tides according to God's word. And y'all don't believe that. Either, must, y'all must be stunned this morning. You're being real cerebral. There won't be a destruction of this earth by a flood. There will be a destruction of this earth, according to the scriptures, by fire. Of which I'm not excited about for people. And God said, this is the token of the covenant. This is my gift of the covenant. This is my sign of the covenant that I will make between you and me and every living creature that's with you for perpetual generations. So that's eternity. Until Jesus comes again, that's eternal, an eternal covenant here. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth, and it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the, the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature and all the flesh of the world. And the water shall be no more and upon a flood shall be no more flesh to be destroyed. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of the flesh that is upon the earth. And God said to Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all the flesh that is upon the earth. Now, we have tokens of covenant, and we'll talk about that in a moment. When we get married, they're called rings, right? Rings are tokens of your covenant. And if you look at that ring, it should remind you that you're married. When God sees the rainbow that he created, he remembers the covenant he made with Noah almost 6,000 years ago. If people would be more mindful of their tokens, guess what? I think we'd have less problems. I can see y'all are buying into this this morning. The fourth covenant is the Abrahamic covenant, which everyone should be excited about it because Abraham's called out of a foreign land. God calls him to a new place. He says, yes, I'm going to go. I'm going to be with this. I'm going to do this. And 15, 8 to 18 says this, and this is very important because when it comes to our covenant of salvation, this is not about you. This is about what Jesus did for you because you don't have the capacity or the ability to make the covenant to keep you eternal. The Abrahamic covenant is in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 15, 8 through 18. And the Lord said, Whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said, Take a heifer of three years old. Here's the animals. And a she-goat of three years old. And a ram of three years old. And a turtle dove and a young pigeon. He took him all these and divided them in the midst. That's what, that's terms of covenant. He laid each piece against the other. But the birds he divided not. When the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. Now listen, sidebar. Whenever you try to establish a covenant, there's always going to be somebody that's going to try to come and pick at your covenant. There's always some buzzers hovering around, hovering around, hovering around, trying to take what is holy, trying to ruin what's holy. Think about that for a moment. So the buzzers came, so what did Abraham do? Abraham shooed them away, got them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And Abram fell into the sleep, and a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, No of a surety that I see shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. Now, that's talking about, this is talking about the captivity in Egypt. With Moses. This is way, way before that. God's talking about what is, what's going to be happening in the covenant down the road. And also, that nation they shall serve, and will I judge, and afterward they shall come out of great abundance, with great substance. And we know they came out with lots and lots of things. And you shall go to your fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not full. And it came to pass that... When the sun went down, it was dark. Behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp passed between the pieces. Now, Abram's in a deep sleep. He's dreaming. He's having visions. He's speaking prophetically to him. And all of a sudden, while all this happening, God comes down 
God comes down as a burning lamp and smoking furnace. We speak of the Father and the Son making this covenant agreement together, walking through these pieces of cut, bleeding meat. They actually walked in a figure eight all through there, passing through there. And in the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying unto their seed, I've given you this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Now, here's the promise of land at the same time, a promise of territory of where Israel's boundary should be. But the covenant was made unto Abraham with the sacrificed bloody animals. The important thing here is this, is that if you're trying to live in covenant with your spouse, can I tell you a secret? You can't do it without him. I'm going to say it again. You can't live in a covenant with your spouse without him. No more than you can save yourself, it's only by him. No more than you can really provide life for yourself, it's by him. Let me listen. Listen to this again. You can't, and listen, you can't really love somebody else. Without him. You can't forgive somebody without him. You can say the words all you want, but until the Lord comes and helps you forgive that person, helps you get to the place that you can bless that person, helps you get to the place that you can live amiable with that person and love with that person and forgiveness, you need him to help you. So every single marriage needs Jesus to help them. Come on. To live in covenant, you need Jesus to help you. Come on. To live as a Christian, you can't do it by works, lest any man should boast. It's by him, by faith, and his grace. We need him to help us live in covenant. Can you say amen? Come on. So if you're frustrated in your marriage, you need Jesus to help you. If you're frustrated with your spouse, you need Jesus to help you. Come on. It's the only way. I said it's the only way. It is the only way that you're going to survive. And that's why covenants have been broken time and time and time again. Our marriages have been broken time and time again. Because when we run out of energy, we get exasperated. You know what we do? We quit. And we find some place we can sign on the dotted line and escape the thing that we can't do. Because you can't do it. You don't have the capacity to live with the person forever. I guarantee you, if it hadn't been for Jesus, my wife would have left me. You're laughing. She ain't going to incriminate herself right now, but listen. (laughs) I am telling, no, I am telling you. You cannot do godly things without him. You cannot live godly without Him. You can't have the fruit of the Spirit without Him. You can't do anything, people. You can't do anything without Him. You don't have the ability to do it. You're just a flea. If you think you are, you're freeloading. You're hiding in the fur of something or somebody. Hello. I'm talking about covenant. Point your neighbor and say, covenant. Talking about covenant. In a covenant. In a covenant. In a, in a covenant, we need some help. That's the fourth and the fifth one is the Mosaic covenant. You might think about uh, Exodus 12 where the Passover happened. That's not it. <laughs> that. This covenant we're talking about moves on to chapter 19 in the book of Exodus. Moses has been up on the top of the mountain. God gives him those commandments, and everybody thinks there's only 10, but there was um, a few more than that. We watched Moses on television with Charleston Heston, and he came down with two tablets and thinks it's just 10, but there's a lot more information that came down from that mountain than just those 10 things. Hello. But we can't even do the 10, so why would we worry about the rest of them? Hello? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, gosh, we don't, I don't even want to do that. I'm not even going to go. That's another message. Okay. 
For they were departed from Rephidim. They were come to the desert of Sinai and pitched a tent in the wilderness and Israel camped at the mountain. And Moses went up to God and the Lord called him out of the mountain and said, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, which means Israel, tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bear you on eagle wings. Hello, how, who, how did they get out? God took them out. God got them out, brought them unto myself. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep what my covenant then you shall be a peculiar treasure and un, unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded them. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. In other words, they confirmed the covenant that God made with them at that juncture right there. Now, can I just ask you a question? Did Israel do a very good job of living within that covenant? They did a horrible job. I mean, it didn't take but just a few days and they're in another whole, they're, they're doing something else. In just a few days, they're probably murmuring again. In a few days, they're doing this. I mean, they just, they just could not live in this covenant. But you know what? God loved them so much, and God was so honorable to his covenant, he kept covenant with them. Now, it took a long time for them to get from point A to point B, but they were still in the covenant. Think about that. They were still in that covenant because God's word was greater than their acts. Then there's a Davidic covenant, which was spoken to David, which has everything to do with Jesus Christ and the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And we could read that in the book of Matthew, but we won't. But I want you to see this in 2 Samuel chapter 7. We're talking about covenant. i got to hurry up here. Now, when... Now then, tell my servant, chapter 7, verse 8, This is what the Lord God Almighty says, I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people, Israel. Now remember, David wasn't even looking to do this. I have been with you wherever you've gone, and I've cut off all your enemies before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I'll provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning and have done ever since this time I appointed leadership over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares that to you, that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. He's talking to David. When your days are over and your rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name and will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, a message within the message here is this is talking about Solomon, but it's also talking about Jesus. And I will be his father. He will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him. Now it's back to Solomon with floggings and respect to people. But my love will never be taken away from him as I took away from Saul whom I remove from before you. Your house and your king will be endured forever and ever, and your throne will be established forever. So we see here the, the meshing here of the promise of David eternally for the kingdom to be established. We see here in the midst, we see Solomon in his dealings in there as well because that was his son who's going to be taken care of because of his misdeeds. But the greater end was that God made a covenant with David, and if you read the scriptures, Jesus Christ was from the lineage, the line, the family of who? Say it. Of, don't be ashamed. Of who? David. That's where this originated from. Right here. So God made a covenant. And then, of course, finally, there's a new covenant that was established when Jesus Christ came. Think about it. Jesus Christ came, he was sent, he dies, he's cut, he's bleeding, there's blood, right? Come on. There's a covenant established. 
I just want to quickly give you a few things about covenant. Now, you might want to write these down. God wants a covenant with us, not a contract. God wants you to be in covenant with your spouse, not a contract. God wants you to be in covenant with each other, not just have a transactional relationship with people. Think about that. Number one, for a covenant to work, there must be a commitment before God. For it to work, there must be a commitment before God. Number two, for a covenant to work, you have to think of it in terms of eternal, which is when I got married, I was thinking eternal. I wasn't thinking about, well, maybe five or six years, you know, I'll just swap, swap out and get somebody else. Or I'll live an open, we'll have an open relationship and we'll just kind of come and go when we want to. No, I had an eternal concept in my mind when I got married. If you get married that way, then you'll stay married that way. I can't even get anybody to say amen. Y'all are thinking hard about this. This, this, this makes you, th- listen, it's a good thing you think before you answer. Because once you answer, then you're in agreement. And when you're in agreement, then you're committed. And when you're committed, the terms are in line for you to live that way. And remember, this may be the starting point for you. Number three, for a covenant to be established, there's got to be gifts that have got to be exchanged. And in the natural, there was gifts exchanged and I love to talk about this one, but I won't talk very much about it. But when David and Jonathan made their relationship with each other, their commitment with each other, their friendship commitment with each other, and there was a, a coat given away, there was belts given away, there was robes given away, there was weapons given away. But in the real sense of the words today, that there's a coat which represents tribe, identity, authority, or family. So there's some sort of coming together of the tribe, the family, the identity. Then number two was there was belts involved in the gifts exchange, which means truth. Truth. I'll never use weapons or faults or failures in your marriage as your enemy is my enemy. In other words, there's a union that comes together that whoever is against you is against me as well. There was also a name change. Today we have, we've always had this, name changes. It's part of each other because of the name. When Adam and Eve were formed and made, they came out of each other. Let's look at this in the New Testament situation, our relationship. There's a new name given to us because of new creation. And also there's a power of attorney given to us that my name is her name. Our name together has parent power. She can sign for me, I can sign for her. But Jesus gave us something else. When you pray, how do you pray? In the name of Jesus. That's a power of attorney term. And then there was a blood exchange, exchange of blood for each party. If you're talking about marriage, you're talking about virgin marriages, you're talking about blood issue was same th- same thing in the end signifying there was a covenant made number four of the covenant for covenant to be real there's got to be vows now mind you when we say vows when we get people to do vows those vows are sacred vows there's the same kind of vows were made in covenant not in a contract because what do we say what do we say whatever we say in the vow to honor to love, to trust, whatever, until what, until what, until what, until what? Those are covenant terms. Those are not contract terms. So we have to have that in mind. We always have to be, that's the way we need to think. If we think that way, it will change the way we live within our covenant. 
Number five is, is there has to be somebody that witnesses this. So Jesus Christ witnesses us. Other people witness what we've done. There had to be a document signed, someone to attest for character. Today we'd use a notary public, or maybe the pastor would sign a document. But way back when I was growing up, my parents had to have two people to sign. Had two people to sign to verify who they were, to verify what they were doing. And the document was that way. <clears throat> Today in the state of Virginia, I only have to sign myself. It's just to be me and the other two. But I am the witness of what happened. But you see, it doesn't have, listen, it doesn't have as much authority as it had before. And you know what? Anybody just about can sign up online and get a, do get a certificate to do weddings. You know that? Let me tell you a short story. The clerk of court's a very good friend of mine. He called me up. He said, you know what? He says, do you know so-and-so? I said, who? He said, so-and-so. He, he said, they go to your church. I said, really? I said, okay. He said, they came down here. They wanted to get, a, um, get uh, credentialed or licensed to do weddings. They said, you sent them. I said, really? <laughs> I sent them. He said, well, I thought something wasn't straight about this he says so i thought i would recall you i said i appreciate it so much but you know there's people that bypass even that and they just get a little document on the on from the internet i've had people i know got them i'm thinking how did you do that and they're doing marriages marriage is supposed to be sacred it's supposed to be covenantal it's not just something that somebody does hello well it's my it's my son or my daughter. It's my friend or my neighbor or my relative or somebody. You know, no. Make it stronger than that, right? Make it more legitimate than that. Really, really make sure it's a covenant that somebody's going to hold you accountable. Six tokens are given. I said rings. Sometimes they would mark scars. On the arms. Today, if you're part of a gang, guess what? You're getting a tattoo or you're going to get a brand. True? I got a guy right over here, right? Gang members to declare their allegiance and their covenant to the gang, right? They'll either get scarred, burnt, or tattooed with some signature on there, some signet. And you know what? Those people honor that to the death, don't they? Are you, why are you smiling? You, huh? What? Right. Oh, we, he, yeah, he's my buddy. But he knows. He's an inside guy. This is the truth. But, man, we can take this thing. Are you married? Huh, what? Who, me? Well, I thought I saw something shining here. Oh, no, no, no. no. Just, we're just kind of indented there. No, I just had a, had a, a surgery there. <laughs> so some people get so committed. Thank you. No, that's not the one you lost. He lost his. He was desperate. He says, you see my ring around here anywhere? <laughs> but listen, my ring is, is oval now. It's not round anymore. Because if you're married any, any length of time... There's going to be some changes about your marriage and your relationship and your life. So mine's oval now. It's not round anymore. These were things to remind you that you're married. You say, well, Pastor, I got a job that's very dangerous and might lose my finger. I say, okay, we'll take the thing off while you doing your work. But as soon as you finish work, you put the thing back on. If I play golf, I take mine off, put it in my bag because it, it bruised my hand, literally. But that's the only time I take it off. Some people get so committed about this covenant that they'll have, it, they'll have theirs tattooed in. I have a tattoo ring. No danger of losing my finger. But I won't lose my marriage because I will never forget about it. Because just like Jesus and God sees a rainbow in the sky, reminds him of the covenant he made. Same as this. And finally, come on back. Come on. In the end, Brand is, is coming now. Everybody grab your cups. In the end of the covenant, 
the finality of the covenant, the thing that sealed the covenant, the last thing that was done for the covenant was they had a meal. They had food. They had drink. There was a celebration that went on. Now, at the end of every wedding, I don't care how big or how small it is, there's some sort of food that's exchanged. There's some sort of drink that happens. And so in the, in the very, very lowest base level, we have a cake reception, right? With maybe some hors d'oeuvres before that, while they're taking pictures. Wherever Kristen's at, they, those eternal pictures. So there's a meal. And the thing that everyone likes the most about the meal is not that you get to get your food and you get the, or you get a nice dinner, you get all these wonderful hors d'oeuvres. Is what everybody likes is when they cut the cake. And the bride and the groom, they both have a piece of cake in their hands. And they hook their arms together. Come here, honey, just so we can show them. We don't have any cake. No, we're not doing communion together either. But, but this is what they do. This produces cake. And they hook their arms like this, right? And then, no, no. 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 Oh, we used to do it like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then go, <laughs> smush it all over the face. She'd be nice, but I want to smush it everywhere. But remember, everybody's so excited about that part. Because you know what? If No matter how they do it, it's going to be memorable. If they smash cake in everybody's face, and there's ice in everywhere, it looks like there's been a pie in their face. Everyone's ex- everyone's like, they remember that. Or if they remember that the guy was real a gentleman and did it nice and sweet. If he does it that way, just be nice and sweet the rest of your marriage. The covenant had a meal. And in the book of Luke, chapter 22 we see where Jesus Christ the last thing he does is come on the last thing he does before he goes to the cross he has a meal all this is about covenant has been talked about but it ain't a covenant until you have the meal it ain't a covenant until you break bread it ain't covenant until there's some drink and food a gathering there's no covenant until all that happens In the book of Luke, Jesus says this, And they went and found, as he had said unto them, that they were made ready for the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him, and he said unto them, With desire of desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And I say unto you, I will not eat any more thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup. So just very carefully separate that top from that bottom. Very delicate. Please throw your cups away at the end. He took the bread and he gave thanks. And he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. So they took the bread and they ate it. So eat your bread. Likewise, also the cup after the supper, saying, This is a cup in my New Testament, in my blood, which is shed for you. And that's another whole message because Jesus had dealt with this in John chapter 6. Talking about identity, talking about relationship, talking about connectivity, talking about bloodlines, all kinds of things are in there. He said, this is the cup of the New Testament in my blood. He was establishing, finalizing the covenant. He said, this is my blood which is shed for you. Drink it and drink all of it. You see, Jesus Christ wants a covenant with us. 
not a contract. He wants a commitment from us that's greater than the commitments we understand in the world we live in. There's going to be people swarming around your life as a believer trying to pick at you, trying to destroy you, trying to haul you off to somewhere else. Because you know what buzzers do? Once they get to a certain place, they'll take the carcass and they'll take it somewhere else. covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you today for your holy word. We thank you for your promises. We thank you, Lord, for the beginning of the covenant, and we thank you for the eternity of the covenant. We thank you, Lord God, that you didn't call us to be fleas. You called us, Lord, to be in relationship. You didn't call us, just call us to be freeloaders. You didn't call, call us to live and mooch off other people. You called us to relationship with you and with one another. In truth, Lord. In name, Lord. In covenant, Lord. In promise, Lord. Lord God, help us live in covenant with everyone that's in this family. And everyone that will be a part of this family, Lord, that we live in covenant. In the Lord, we will bind together. We'll love together. We'll fight together. We'll work together. We'll increase together. We'll be strong together. Lord, because you are a covenant God. So, Lord, help us live in covenant. Stand to your feet just one moment. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. I pray in Jesus' name right now, Lord God, that you would enable us to live in covenant, God, with your help, with your strength, your name, your power, and your authority. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. I promise I won't be this long next week, but I've been gone for a week. So God bless you. Love on somebody. I'll see you at the front door. God bless you. If you did a visitor's packet, please give us the card before you leave. Thank you. Need, I will bring my heart.